So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back for our final Lunch and Learn series on uh, Engaging Youth Voices Lunch and Learn. Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, the topic on healing for youth programming, understanding to support youth from all racial backgrounds. So I hope that you have a nice lunch prepared, um, ready to hear this great content with these great panelists. But before we start, I want to give them a chance to introduce themselves. And we can start with uh, Mr. Hughes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Woody Hughes, Jr. I serve as the Assistant Extension State 4-H Program Leader at Fort Valley State University, which is an 1890 land-grant university in the state of Georgia. I also serve as the Extension Committee of, on Organizational Policy for setting um, national 4-H system guidelines for the 1890 region. I'm the state 4-H program leader representative for all 19 land-grant universities. And I'm also a former criminal justice instructor from Central Georgia State University. Thank you. Thank you. Bethany? Hi, I'm Bethany Eigel. I am the 4-H agent in Chesterfield County in Virginia, and I am also the state program leader for families. I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Dr. Franklin? Good morning. Greetings from this great state of Louisiana. My name is Tiffany Franklin, and I serve as the Associate Youth Specialist and Program Leader at the Southern University Agricultural Research and Extension Center. And Dr. Webster. Hello, I'm a professor at Penn State University uh, in the area of youth development and civic engagement. I'm in, located in the College of Agricultural Sciences in the Department of Agricultural Economics, Sociology, and Education. Awesome. Awesome. And we welcome you to the great state of Virginia. <laughs> um, now I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Crystal for our next, next phase. Thanks, all. Um... As you can see, there's a question here, and we'd like for you to, re to respond in the chat box. Um, you saw the topic. This is the last in our three-part series. So why do you think it's important to make the effort to reach young people from all racial backgrounds? And, and as a reminder, if you'd like for everyone to see your post, you can choose the drop down box that says all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, just those of us whose um, pictures you see can see your responses. I see Krista says, because the world is diverse, we must be able to lift all voices and develop compassion for the experiences of all. Tara says, all you should feel part of the 4-H community. So those are some 4-H folks. Deborah says, provides unity where everyone can belong. Yes, youth are our future. All you should be included. Um, lots of things. Kids represented for the future, um, represent the future for all mankind. It's our duty to lead them correctly. Absolutely. Everyone's voice matters, feels like they should belong, sense of belonging. Yes, for sure. So these are, I mean, the reasons why we think it's important to make the extra effort and take the time. Um, and do the work that it needs, um, that it takes to make this happen, because it doesn't just happen. It takes intentionality to do that. So there's a pretty fair amount of agreement on the importance of making the reach. So now we'd ask you also in the chat to share what's challenging, what's challenging to you and to others about reaching, serving, and supporting youth from various racial backgrounds. The anger, someone has posted the anger. Language barriers. 
breaking through to you. Um, mistrust. Some is a timing. They have, quote, better things to do. Some are identifying some logistical things like transportation, um, little staff. You see one that says challenging what they've learned at home. Um, one person identifies uh, funding challenges that are geared, um, some of the funding geared toward particular races um, more than others. Being culturally competent and remaining current with constant changes. Perceptions. Surely there's not a, um, not, a, not a lack in the things that are challenging. And yet let's go back to why it's important. And is it important enough for us to really do the work that it takes to push past those barriers um, so that we are really reaching, supporting, and serving youth from all racial backgrounds in our programming? So that's where we'll go with the session on today. And I'm going to ask Dr. Smith to share um, some other content with us before we get to our expert panelists. Dr. Smith? Thank you. So one of the overarching, I guess, themes with our Lunch and Learn series, as well as our, um, some of our dialogue and some of our other sessions, is listening to learn and understand. It is truly important to listen to learn and understand. And I know that it kind of sounds um, very simple, but a, a lot of the uh, questions that we just pose in the chat can, can come from being able to listen to learn and understand. And the biggest communication problem is we do not listen to understand, we listen to reply. How many uh, examples or extension or, you know, what workforce uh, particular opportunities for professional development or just in general your work that you've came across of being in a situation where someone is talking about their lived experience and we're, we're always in our mind trying to solve the problem versus actually listening to their lived experience. And you can see the, the comparison between both, you know, it's, it can tend to be more um, of a, a asset and a, like a, just a check mark when we take the time to listen, to learn and understand on someone's lived experience. Next. So uh, with, with the listening to learn and understand, um, solutions appear through listening. We seek first to understand, then to be understood. Um, how do you respond when you hear something you don't want to hear? Um, and this is something that we're even discussing in some of our dialogues, how do we get past that? How do we get to the core? I think, you know, we have to start processing and learning the way to listen, to learn and understand. Many of us have the blank looks, the interrupt or distracted. And I, I often tell some of my colleagues, you know, we all need to have that friend to check us. We need to look in the mirror and see how our facial expression is meant because we may not uh, mean anything by it, just how we, you know, our norm, but these are things that can help us in our work. Um, are simply waiting to be able to say something rather than listening to learn and understand. It is important, even if, and this is something that I'm even working through, sometimes you may just have to take note. Sometimes you may have to sit there and just jot down one word that are com that's coming in your head versus you know, just saying, hey, I want to fix the solution. You just want to listen to people's lived experience, especially when you feel tired, hungry, angry, or threatened. You know, that, that tip on the slide, take a break, take care of yourself so you can be a better place to listen. And I wish we had the little buttons where you can raise your hand. How many of you all have had experiences where you felt threatened or angry or hungry or just tired. And that's conflicting with you being able to be a better listener. You know, I can raise my hand. It happens. It happens to us all. But this is the time to really hone in on that skill. Next slide. So the two types of listening, active listening and empathetic listening. 
Now the active reflect back, what I understand you to say is blank, blank, and blank. No more judgments, just restate. So I can say from personal experience, the active listening is something that I'm using in my own uh, life, in my own family. Uh, I will be getting married next year. So my fiance, we are working on this active listening thing now. I'm telling you, it works. It definitely works. It might be some little uh, frustration there, but it, it definitely works. Um, in empathetic, em empathetic listening, understand the depth of what is said, uh, more than just listening to words. What is the message? What can you get out of the message? Uh, put self in place of the speaker. Exper experiencing their emotions. It, it is definitely essential to listen at the lived experience and put yourself in someone else's shoes. I think we, we go to through too much of, you know, this is my experience, your experience, but often listen to their experience and then reflect back if that was you. And that's where you can kind of see a lot, some emotion in different things. Next slide. So uh, this quote, listening to see, learning to see things from various points of view is an important skill as I've stated in, in some of the other slides. It enhances intellect and by pushing us to challenge our assumptions and build social skills by encouraging emotional intelligence, empathy, and compassion. But focus on those three, those three words um, at the end, emotional intelligence, empathy, and compassion. And I think, and, and I know our panelists will get to that in some of our later questions. When we talk about all racial backgrounds and all youth and, and these things, we have to really, and, and it could be uncomfortable, and that's okay. We have to put ourselves in those uncomfortable situations to build those social skills on emotional intelligence, empathy, and compassion. And that, that will take time, and that's okay. Next slide. So we have another question that we'd like you to think about and, and post in the chat. And we realize your stories are, are probably much longer than what could be posted in chat. But if you could give a, a, a synopsis in chat of when you realized that people got treated differently because of the color of their skin. Okay, I see someone posted ninth grade, first grade, third grade, when they moved to um, Virginia. Around the age of five, around the age of four, five or six, watching the news. Age 10, um, when they moved to the US, very young, five, very young, very young, very young, first grade, first grade. Yeah, absolutely. So as we think about the, the, um, the current conversations and, and um, the youth um, that we are working with, that many of us are raising, serving, and, and supporting, as we think about the time frame of our recognition that people got treated differently, how do we frame the context for children now? Sometimes we forget how early we learn some of these tough things and we, and we may think that we're shielding children from something that's difficult when in fact, the likelihood of them not knowing already is pretty slim. They pretty well know that this is already a fact. And so how do we then t um, help them process through at their young ages what that means, what the meaning of that is and be able to move, move forward from that and engage them in those conversations and in those efforts, so. Okay. So as we think about trust and, and building, um, building trust and, and many of us have or are currently working in, in spaces directly supporting and serving youth, we know the importance of building trust um, with youth in our programming. So how important is listening and building trust.
extremely important. It's a key element. Um, home education about diversity. Extremely important. Very important. Trust. The question, trust in what? Very important. It's crucial. Absolute. Extremely important. Okay. So how do you know when you're listening well? What's happening for you when you're listening well? What does that look like? Sometimes when we're listening well, we are attentive, we're making eye contact, we're leaning in, we're not distracted, um, right? Those are things that we do when we're not listening well. I see some engaged, not using your phone, you're able to formulate questions. There's a conversation that's flowing back and forth. Um, yeah, so when you're listening well, that's what that might look like, right? You're able to respond intentionally with intent. Um, so what's happening when you're not listening well? What does that look like? You're distracted. You don't care. People know when you don't care. You can't remember what the person said. Dismissive, disengaged, unfocused, no eye contact, zoned out, poor body language, right? Looking around, not focused, looking away, right? Doing multiple things at the same time. We know the myth about multitasking, right? We don't let other people speak. We change this ch topic, shift to something else. Yeah, so we know what it looks like when we're listening well. We know what it looks like when we're not listening well, and we know how important it is to listen if we're trying to establish a relationship that has trust, a trusting relationship um, with the people in which we're engaged. And we know this as adults, and our youth know as well, um, whether we're actually listening um, or we're not. So just some things to be mindful of. Dr. Smith? So the power of being heard, people start to heal the moment that they feel heard. Um, and I guess I would pose that to another, raise your hand if you have been in an experience where you felt um, healed or you felt empowered when you were heard. You know, I can, I can attest to that myself. People are more likely to act after they've, emot after they've emotionally connected with someone else's story. That's why it's important that we share, you know, the listening to learn those uh, social skills to, um, to, to consider with the emotional intelligence, the empathy and compassion. That's where we start. That's, that's where we start this, this conversation of, of trying to heal, um, trying to, uh, listening to understand individuals' lived experience. All right, and so um, just very quickly, and, and we will share this out with, with everyone who's registered for this session, but um, there is a framework out there that's referred to as the skilled dialogue framework, and there's been a lot of work that's been done with children and even um, particularly um, young children in, in early childhood education, but the three things we wanted to pull out of this was there are these qualities referred to as the three R's, these behaviors and qualities um, for programming, um, so it moves from what you can do in, an, in a dialogue session to how you might apply this in your programming as well, because it has to go back to the building relationship and the listening um, piece of building those relationships. So the first R is res respect, uh, and that is an honoring identity. So, and, and the thing you can ask yourself is, have you made an intentional choice to give greater priority to who you are um, in relation to me and who I am in relation to you, rather than to what I want you to do 
what I want you to participate in or how I want you to change. So how are you thinking about that in terms of res respect with identity, the reciprocity, so honoring everyone's voices, the young people's voices that, are, that um, we are looking to reach, serve, and support, and then responsiveness, so honoring the, the connection. So those are some, some pieces. So this is where we are with, um, they're the things that we have in place and we like to plan and organize and have some sense of control and semblance over what's happening. Um, and in this framework, they call the moving to the next level, setting the stage for miracles, right? So do I believe that there are really other choices? Am I intentional and, and remaining open to discover what they are? So how open are you to listening, hearing, um, and honoring what the youth are saying. So um, we just wanted to you know, just kind of share this nugget and we'll send it out and we'll send the list to the reference if you have interest in digging a little further into that. Um, but we, we just wanted to call it out um, and share that with you. So we'll move into um, the questions for our panelists. And the first question we have for our panelists is, how can we move forward despite discomfort to reach youth from all racial backgrounds? And Dr. Franklin, maybe start with you. Thank you, Crystal. Um, first, when I took a look at this question, the first thing that came to mind is um, when we think about in an effort to move forward as professionals, we have to remove biases. Um, I saw several comments in the uh, chat box um, saying that everyone is hurting um, people black and white. Um, it start, education starts in the home, you know, being heard um, <clears throat> is but in my opinion, being heard first and then seeing those action is, uh, are necessary um, for me. But being open-minded is necessary. And there's another question that comes to mind that I feel like probably should be addressed prior to this one is where does this actual discomfort lie? You know, is it within myself or is it within the individuals that I'm speaking to? Am I feeling uncomfortable when I present these things or this conversation? Um, so that's the question that comes to mind before we move into any of those things. You know, where is the level of discomfort before we can move past that to address the real issue? Um, this is definitely a candid conversation that needs to happen on all levels. And again, removing those biases uh, for me are essential. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. Mr. Hughes, you wanna chime in? You're on, you're on mute. I think we, as he's coming back on, Dr. Webster, can we come to you for this one? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, when, I, when I saw this question, first of all, thank you for um, asking, I think, a, a question that needs to be asked in this space. Um, I would echo the comments that Dr. Franklin made, but I would even um, ask us to understand what does it mean to be uncomfortable in these spaces? Because oftentimes we want to jump from, you know, this place of being uncomfortable to this place of euphoria and without really understanding what has caused these pains, what has caused the pains of these individuals um, that we're seeing or that we're working with, um, understanding where that pain has come from. And I think oftentimes we don't want to be uncomfortable. And so one thing that um, I remember my mother always saying growing up is you need to sit steady in the boat. And I never understood what that meant, but it means sitting with your place of being uncomfortable, wrestling with those issues, um, educating yourself on you know, the experiences, the mindset of other people, so that you can then be in a place 
to begin to move forward and make um, some changes. Thank you. Mr. Hughes, you ready? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. All right, I apologize about that. Um, thank you, Crystal. What um, comes to mind when I think about moving forward to reach youth from all racial backgrounds with discomfort is to ask yourself, what is the root cause of your discomfort and how do you define discomfort? Once you're able to know why you feel discomfort and what the root cause of that is, you're in the beginning stages of being able to resolve or towards a resolution that can be agreeable to reaching all youth. You want to begin to also ask yourself, what are your values? What do you value the most? And if you truly value wanting to reach all youth with, with all different racial backgrounds, you wanna be open-minded and open-hearted. And then you want to be able to go into communities with the demographics of people that you may not know to start the beginning process of building relationships with trusted leaders and trusted community stakeholders that can help you in the process to begin something that can be great and sustainable throughout all ages. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Bethany? Um, you know, so I think a lot of the time uh, discomfort comes from just unknowing and, and not being aware, not being educated about someone else and the path that they've walked in and, um, you know, being a little bit too focused on what's different instead of embracing what's similar and, and how we can come to some common ground and what, what are we sharing that we care about? Um, you know, we're, we're all very focused on differences and, um, you know, the, the, the fear of reaching out for some people might be overwhelming due to those differences. And um, it's, while it's important to recognize those, it's, um, you know, I guess I'm in such a space of working with kids and seeing that th those children, whatever the background is, they have some really basic needs that I feel I am um, in a place to provide in partnership with parents and other um, caring adults. And you have to come from that, that angle of it and, and really want to make sure that all kids are having equal access to those just basic needs for them to thrive and be successful um, and in, in turn, while you're doing that, making sure that those youth are all um, acknowledging and respecting one another and carrying that forward. And, and so, you know, that's, I'll be honest, um, it's, it's sometimes easier for me to look to my youth um, as the charge for, for this very thing. You know, I'm well aware that it, that for those relationships to be true, it has to come from a place of trust as well. And um, so I'm really leaning into what the kids are saying right now and and their their approach is is fresh and a little bit different than the adult perspective. And so that's that's something that is hard for some adults to do. They don't they don't want to take the time to sit back and listen to the kids or let them lead, but I, I think right now it's really important to do that. Thank you so much. So, so as we move forward, the next question for the panelists, how does the racial makeup of the staff impact reaching, serving, and supporting youth from various racial backgrounds? I guess I can start with Mr. Hughes. The racial makeup of the staff may or may not impact reaching, serving, or supporting youth from various racial backgrounds. For example, if you hire a predominant staff of African Americans to impact your capacity to reach and impact new underserved, underrepresented youth, 
who may be predominantly African Americans, this may be an effective strategy or it may not be an effective strategy depending on the values, work ethics, and passion that the hired staff has about the audiences they were hired to reach. It's been my professional work and experience since 1995 to now that the race of the staff is not as important as the content of the character of the hired staff. If you hire staff who have a content of character that reflects moral integrity, non-racial bias, and if they are self-starters, who are purpose and passionate driven to do the work that they were hired to do, you will have an awesome and sustainable team that will best do the work they were hired to do without you having to be physically in their presence in order for them to actually do the work they were hired to do. You must always be honest, transparent, patient, humble, and caring. Thank you. Thank you, Woody. Would any of our other panelists like to comment on the question? Um, I would like to take just a slightly different approach. I do believe that we need to start from a place of um, making sure that our staff or individuals who we hire have the skill set, the compassion, um, the ability to connect with our young people. But on the other side of that, we also know from research that when young people do not see individuals in these caring spaces that look like them and reflect the values that um, Mr. Hughes has um, noted, that there is a disconnect. And so we have to be purposeful and intentful when we are hiring um, individuals, when we are seeking volunteers, we need to make sure that we do include all races, all, you know, ethnic backgrounds, um, but really making sure that as we're training those individuals, bringing them on board, what are the support systems and values that some of these groups may need? Because we do know that we're, we're living in a society where some youth, so immigrant youth or um, other, <clears throat> like our LGBTQ communities, that those individuals are going to need certain support systems that maybe someone from another ethnic group or background may not have because they haven't lived that experience. So I do think that we need to be careful by, by saying that we, you know, we, that we, we don't have to do that. I think we have to be intentional and purposeful about who we put in front of our kids um, and who these staff are that they make sure they understand what it means to support uh, these kids from, from various backgrounds. I think Dr. Webster makes an excellent point that um, I, I share that view as well and think um, while I, I do agree and in, in, um, Mr. Hughes made some good points as well, but um, it's important that youth can have role models that they relate to and feel that, um, you know, I guess I don't want to think about it in a two dimensional way. I mean, <laughs> extension is not always operating with the hugest staff, <laughs> but we can, we can build our own capacity with the volunteers, with the team leaders, with um, even the, the media that you're using in trainings, make sure that you're intentional about you're picking out and showing and holding up as examples um, in, in the programming that you're doing and make sure that it's, representative of, of everyone. So I do agree with Dr. Webster. I think that's important to, to be intentional. All right. Dr. Franklin, did you have anything for this question? The comments have already um, been conveyed by the other panelists in an effort not to, you know, be the dead horse in a sense, um, just to be, you know, redundant. Um, I do agree with everything that they have said, primarily the individuals that work with our youth having compassion, um, in addition to having people who look like them and are representative of the clientele that we serve. So I agree with what has already been stated. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, to take this conversation a little bit further, 
Um, how do you reach and support youth participation in program when they are from a different ethnic or racial background than the staff? And Dr. Franklin, we can come to you first for this one. Well, again, I think this kind of extends uh, from the previous question. Um, when you're talking about uh, recruiting staff, volunteers, um, we need to make sure that everyone is represented um, and, and compassionate people. I was uh, told it early, very early on in my career, probably even during internship phases, you know, the first question I was asked, you know, you working with kids, are you crazy? You know, and it's like, what do you mean? We have to save every child, regardless of what they look like, one child at a time. And how do we get to that? It's, um, I really genuinely believe it, it has so much to do with that, that personal level of compassion. You know, do I really want to do whatever it takes to save this child, regardless of what they look like? Um, we understand that the levels of communication will be uh, very different. Um, the way that I can walk up and talk to a Caucasian child, they may not be as receptive as an African-American child would be. But um, at that point, I have my colleagues and some volunteers that have been trained and who have that compassion that genuinely want to reach that child. So I, I think that we need to make sure that we are, um, like uh, Dr. Webster said, you know, purposeful and intent, um, act with intent to um, make sure that we have everyone represented um, when we're hiring, recruiting, and recruiting uh, for participation. Thank you. Uh, other panelists who would like to chime in on this question? Um, I think one, one point that I'd like to raise is this point of youth voice. Um, I think that that has not been uh, mentioned before, but I think youth have to uh, be at the table, helping to make some of these decisions. I, I teach a class on youth civic engagement, and um, the first week we talk about this definition of what is you know, youth activism, civic engagement, being engaged. And the definition that I've created that I use is not just having youth at the table, but them understanding the value of their voice in making decisions to change the status quo. And I think oftentimes young people don't realize that. So when we're talking about reaching um, and supporting our, our young people, oftentimes we are creating programs for them, but not with them. And I think if we really are talking about this notion of being intentional and purposeful, young people have to understand that their voice is going to make a difference. And especially if we're talking about reaching um, ethnically and racially you know, different um, youth and our staff are different, we have to make sure these, um, these young people um, are, are offering you know, their opinions and ideas to help enrich that environment. Thank you. And I agree with what Deborah just said. Training staff is important. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Franklin. Um, Bethany or Mr. Hughes? Um, I agree with uh, what the pan panelists have said. I would just add that you have to take on the personal responsibility to um, create uh, new collaborative partnerships with people who have the trust of the youth and families that you want to reach. Explain the purpose of the work that you wanna do with your new potential audiences. Admit your lack of experience or, and your lack of relationships with the racial demographics that you wanna reach as you aspire to learn from them and grow with them with the program that you represent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Bethany, we heard you mentioning um, how you're reaching out to the youth right now to help guide you through programming and, and listening to the, um, the voices for what next steps might be. So thank you all. Next question, um, how do we support youth that have experienced challenges around their own racial background?
Okay, I'll go. Um, from, from a state 4-H program leader perspective, this is coming from a risk management safety first perspective in alignment with university guidelines. Before you can best support you, before you can best support youth that have experienced challenges around their own racial background, you must first address your own experiences around racial background. Second, you must be professionally trained to facilitate racial dialogues that specifically address racial challenges in a multiracial safe training space. However, a person must be willing to undergo um, being professionally trained to facilitate racial dialogues that specifically address racial challenges. And you must always be honest, transparent, patient, humble, and caring. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, have our other panelists want to comment? I just want to chime in real quick. And when we think about support, um, just like Mr. Hughes indicated, um, is just sharing um, some of our personal experiences and letting them know um, that we can overcome some of those challenges. Um, you know, many of us um, and earlier in your presentation, um, Dr. Smith, um, I saw something where you said exhausted, you know, um, we're hungry. You know, we could be hungry for more knowledge on how to deal with these issues, but we could also be exhausted with having to address these, um, these issues over and over and over again. So um, just, you know, in my opinion, the children that I deal with, um, specifically who always ask me why, why does this continue to happen? I wish I had the answer to that. And I saw um, someone's comment about uh, when I said having to remove biases, you know, it's like, you know, putting a camel through the eye of a needle. I do agree, but that does not negate the fact that we do not continue to, con to continue to try to remove those biases. When I go into a room, I can't label a kid. I can't see that, but is everyone going to think like I think? Absolutely not. Um, so we have to just continue to make sure that um, we're um, just being vigilant in our efforts to support them and to know that, you know, this may not be going away anytime soon, if ever. But how do you address it? Because I've been through it. You can get through it too, and I'm here to support you. Thank you. Just want to add real quickly to that, um, the points that have been made, being vulnerable um, in the spaces that we are with young people, um, but also making sure that we uplift their stories. So oftentimes we want to suppress um, the experiences that these young people have faced are facing um, and continue, will continue to face. And I think that the spaces that we sit in as youth development specialists or um, researchers, we have to make sure that we uplift um, their stories, the positive, but also helping them to detangle um, the, the challenging moments because we have to understand they still are young people. And so we provide we can provide those spaces um, to help them understand what they are dealing with. So I think that through our vulnerability and through uplifting and listening, um, we, can, we can provide better uh, support systems um, for these young people to understand how to, you know, how they're dealing with this. And, and also, um, I had a, one last point, is to validate what it is that they are feeling and, and experiencing because sometimes I, I've heard in, in certain situations and conversations that people want to sweep these things under the rug and we are doing our young people a disservice when we do do that. That's exactly what I wanted to, to say as well. Um, you said it better than I could have but it, it's um, for anyone that's working with youth and, and they are they are being vulnerable enough to share something that they've experienced, you must return that um, tenfold and, you know, acknowledge the feelings that they're having and don't dismiss it by, you know, 
it's great to share that you've also maybe had that experience, but don't dismiss what they've had by saying, oh, I had that happen to me too, and this is this, this. Every person is different in how they respond and react to things. And so letting them know that just because um, that same experience didn't upset or hurt someone else, it is okay for them to feel upset, hurt, angry, confused. Um, and then I just wanted to make one other point as a, a 4-H agent. Um, my, my place is to help them to channel those experiences, positive and negative, into something um, that can help them to lift their voice up to maybe make a difference in their own lives and someone else's, um, use their voice through art, through a 4-H project, through a sport, whatever that is that helps them. Um, and even if it's not through me as a 4-H agent, who can I connect them with that's going to help them to, to feel like they're being heard and can take the, the first step towards healing and then they will be able to go and help someone else when they see someone else going through that pain or that experience that shared experience um so yeah i just i love what dr webster said about making sure that we're vulnerable and um listening because that's that is the absolute first step and if you if you do a misstep in that very first um, engagement, it can really erode the trust that that youth had to even come to you um, with their challenges. Thank you. Thank you. We also wanted to ask them, what are some leadership opportunities in which youth from all racial backgrounds can engage? The first thing that comes to mind is what we're doing today, right now. This is a magnificent opportunity, which I hope to see more of in the future. But um, from a national cooperative extension system perspective, I think the coming together for racial harmony and understanding training is one of the best um, learning opportunities that we have that can be um, tailor-made for youth or for adults in a safe space. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to, I'll mention something that maybe may seem a little uh, off kilter because my world really does revolve around um, youth from within and across the African diaspora. And so I think that there are a number of um, leadership opportunities within like your local uh, UN um, local chapters. So those are experiences that young people have that speak to what we've just talked about. Seeing and working with both adults and youth from various um, backgrounds. I also think that there, there are a number of youth um, leadership, local youth leadership, sorry, not local, but regional and statewide um, leadership uh, opportunities that our young people can be channeled to in order to, again, build those leadership skills, but begin to work with people who may be racially different, ethnically different, um, you know, have a different gender, whatever that lens may be, but it allows them to situate themselves in a place where they're going to be pushed um, with their thinking pushed with their ideologies and values, um, I think to then bring that back even to their local 4-H clubs if these young people are involved in those. Bethany, did you have a perspective you wanted to share? I'll just say quickly, I think some of this goes back to um, a previous question and why to me it's so important that at all different levels we've got some role models for young people to look up to that they can relate to that they see in positions of importance that they can aspire to and if they're not seeing that or if that's not available 
it's on us to make them understand that it is possible and to lift them up and to support them, give them the extra encouragement to be the first to go after a position that maybe is not traditionally something they would have thought about because to me, any leadership position out there is available to any youth of any background. It's a matter of them going out for it and it's a matter of us as a caring adult to encourage a diverse spectrum of youth going after these opportunities. Um, so that's, that's my perspective there. Thank you. You know, I wanted to ask the panelists, were there any final takeaways that you would like to share? And I know Dr. Franklin had to, she had to get on another call, so we appreciate her time on this um, lunch and learn session. But for this final takeaway question, did you all have any final, um, final comments? Um, so I'd like to start, I have two comments, final comments. One, um, I would like to share with both Dr. Smith and Dr. Tyler Mackey um, a resource guide around um, talking to children, racial violence and race, and talking to children um, about these issues. And so it's a resource for, that was developed for parents, but I think it definitely can be um, spun to uh, a guide for anyone who's working with young people. So I would like to share those. And it's not just books, it's actually videos and um, other things as well. Secondly, I'm on a team that will be, um, that's creating a number of um, dialogues for individuals. And so those should be coming out fairly soon about how to have these uncomfortable yet needed conversations. And my last point is, um, this is just, something that I thought about uh, when this last question was posed to us. Being an ally to our youth and the struggles they are facing means facing your own biases, finding ways to address those and standing alongside them and behind them as they remain on this journey of social justice and self-identity. Self Thank you. Mr. Hughes. Final takeaways. Um, I would say with all the dialogue that we've had and this being the third um, component to this opportunity that we're participating in, always be honest, transparent, patient, humble, and caring with all the youth and adults that you serve and work with and want to reach. This is not easy work. Each person is where they are in their own growth. And if you truly want to be successful with being able to reach all youth of all diverse backgrounds and ethnicities, you have to be true to yourself and identify your own biases and be patient with others that may not be at the point of growth that you may be at, but I'll know that there's good in all individuals. And if mm -hmm. you really want to help people, look for, the, look for only the good and everyone and be forgiven of all. Thank you. Rebecca? Sure. Hard comments to follow. I would echo um, what each have said and just to really, um, wherever you are in your corner of the world, um, each of us can start by not only this self-examination as we move forward, but um, how can we best serve our communities? How can we best uplift the youth and support the work that they're doing to also move forward? Um, so we, we really can make a difference just by taking small steps. It doesn't need to feel, this is a huge, huge issue and it can get overwhelming. Um, so collectively, if each of us can start making some of the small changes and steps towards moving forward, I think um, we, we will affect change. It will take time, but I, I feel positive about that. Thank you. So, 
So we, we definitely want to thank everyone. I want to thank our wonderful panelists. Thank you so much for uh, assisting us with our last uh, Lunch and Learn series session on, um, on this uh, very important topic. Um, I, would, I would end on uh, Mr. Woody's comment on looking at yourself, but also owning up to your own. Um, you know, I think pride takes too much of us moving forward and let's try to put pride away and, and try to own up to some, some things that we don't understand so that we can make a change. Um, thank you so much. And I'll leave it to Crystal to close us out. Thanks all. Um, you'll get a survey link. We'd love to hear your feedback. That would help us in, um, in moving forward. And we'll send out those resources that have been mentioned as well as a recording of this link as soon as it is available. Thank you so much for joining in and feel free to share any of that out with any of your colleagues that you think would benefit. So thanks all and enjoy the rest of this day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.